This video is for chapter 10, which is entitled Sociology of the Body, Chronic Illness and Disability. However, if you've read this chapter, if you reviewed the notes, you know that really the chapter is on sociology of the body and um, several ways in which sociologists approach studying the body, um, which includes chronic illness and disability, uh, but also goes kind of beyond that. Uh, so we will be discussing um, the ideas from this chapter. And the chapter begins with kind of introducing the concept of sociology of the body, because the body is understood to be both natural, organic, and a product of its social environment. Um, meaning, of course, you know, it's, it's, it's biological. We're, we're born with our body and our body has certain biological, biochemical functions, um, which we would we would have those in any society you know if we were stranded on on an island somewhere you know our hearts would beat our brains uh you know synapses uh, synapses would 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 fire um, our lungs would breathe uh, perhaps you can tell by these examples that I do not have a, a, a background in human anatomy. Um, but, you know, my point here is, is there are some things that our bodies would do um, in any society, um, including if we were, you know, out of society, just off somewhere by ourselves. But at the same time, the body is also a product of its social environment. So, you know, the food that we eat, um, the, the, the hygiene practices that, that, that we uh, engage in, um, you know, what we do or don't do with our body hair, how we treat natural body processes like, you know, uh, childbirth, uh, menstruation, aging, um, how we approach shows, all of those kind of reflect, of course, our social environment their embodied practices that uh, reflect kind of the society that they're happening in. Um, so, you know, there, there is an argument to be made that, yes, of course, sociologists should study the body. Um, but your book notes that sociologists have had initially a reluctance to study the body. Um, one reason for that is because they're unwilling to engage with biological determinist explanations of human behavior. Uh, so in a discipline where we're often pointing at society as being the primary cause for who people are, how they behave the way that they do, why they think the way that they think. You know, if you study the body, you have to be prepared to kind of address to some sense that there are biological processes at play that are also maybe shaping um, some of these some of these topics. Um, and for a long period of time, a lot of sociologists just weren't really comfortable. Um, that felt way too far outside of our lane. The second reason why we had initial reluctance to study the body has to do with the history of sociology itself. If you look at our early founding fathers, people like Durkheim, Marx, Weber, Goffman, well, Goffman really isn't an early founding father, but, but yeah, if you look at our early founding fathers, um, they were not, this is not what they were studying. They were studying largely macro sociological kind of, uh, you know, approaches to society, large scale social processes, large social institutions, what role they play. You know, they really weren't even looking uh, too closely at the individual, let alone the body itself. However, probably in the last 50 or so years, there has been a shift which now makes the study of the body of of greater interest to sociologists. And there is that chart that just kind of talks about some possible topics um, and, and approaches that sociologists might embrace when it comes to uh, studying the body, incorporating the body in their research. Um, and I have the topics from that table listed there. But regardless of kind of which specific topic uh, sociologists embrace, um, if they are engaging in sociology of the body, um, they usually are drawing attention to what your book notes as being two key social aspects of the body. Uh, the first is the impact of environmental, cultural, social, and political influences on the body. And then the second is the knowledge that the body is shaped by certain dominant cultural discourses or institutions. So I've already kind of talked about number one. Um, so let me talk a little bit about just what, what does number two even mean? It means that, you know, um, we oftentimes understand the body 
um, even if we're approaching it from this biological um, uh, kind of approach. We understand it through the lens of medicine and science. Um, but keep in mind that medicine and science are social institutions, right? Um, they, they are not objective, just kind of free floating, you know, outside of social influence entities. No, um, what we consider to be medical knowledge, what we consider to be scientific knowledge is of course shaped by the society in which um, they are happening in at that time. Um, you know, all you can kind of do, sometimes it's hard to be that critical of the science and the medicine, uh, medical knowledge that is currently dominant in your own society. But if you look at past scientific and medical knowledge that we have since discarded, um, you can see how some of that was clearly shaped by, you know, what was going on in that society at that time. Who was in power? What type of values did they have? Have, what type of prejudices and biases did they have? Um, and then you can see that kind of creep into sup the supposedly objective medical and scientific knowledge of that time. Um, because science and medicine is not being led by, you know, non-human robots uh, who aren't products of, uh, of their social environment. Um, you know, science and medicine are practiced and being engaged in by human beings and human beings are a product of their society. So thus, science and medicine are a product of society. Um, you know, your book does does tell you, though, you know, just because that is the case, that doesn't mean there is not like this objective kind of uh, aspect, um, you know, to people's, uh, you know, bodily experiences, um, you know, to their symptoms, to their, you know, their, their, their complaints, to the, to, to the, the, what it feels like to actually, you know, be sick or to be well. Um, so your book warns you to not fall into the, you know, it warns you that sociologists can fall into the trap of theoreticism. You know, we can treat everything as if it was theoretical, as if it was socially constructed and not real. Um, but by doing so, you know, we, we ignore the fact that there is a very lived experience of embodiment. Um, so when we talk about a disease being socially constructed, you know, that kind of takes away from the fact that for the people who are experiencing that disease, they nevertheless have very real symptoms. They're having very real lived experiences related to that disease. Even if, you know, what we're saying is, is, you know, we've created this label for the, for this set of phenomena. And once we created this label, you know, of course we, we, we give it weight, we give it social significance, you know, no one's not, no one's disputing that. But at the same time, for the people who are experiencing that said disease and whatever, you know, or, or disorder and whatever symptoms may come along with that, they aren't necessarily fabricating their experience just because what we are saying is that the phenomena itself is socially constructed. So just keep in mind that, you know, that is not the argument um, that, that, that sociologists should be making. And most of them, of course, aren't trying to make that argument. So this chapter is kind of split up in kind of three broad categories, um, which kind of reflect ways in which we can kind of approach studying the body, uh, identifying the body. Um, the, the first of those uh, broad categories is, is called the civilized body. Um, and then we have the sculptured body and then we have the failed body. Uh, so for the civilized body, yeah, the big focus here is that um, there are our, our views on what is appropriate bodily behavior and who has access to our bodies. Um, and those views on what is appropriate bodily behavior and who should have access to our bodies, um, it can, of course, complicate uh, uh, health care and the relationship bet uh, between health care and the population. And so two kind of key concepts that come out of this, this discussion uh, are the concept of privacy um, and, and the, the concept of control. Because generally speaking, when we're not ill, when we're not seeking out health care, the expectation is, is that you have, you know, a right to your bodily autonomy, the right to, you know, it's your body. <clears throat> 
and, and we tend to think you have some rights to some privacy uh, in regards to that. And then we also think that you should have control over your body and your bodily uh, functions. And that expectation that you should have bodily control over your bodily functions is, of course, related to the fact that, especially in Western societies, uh -huh. the body and its functions are regarded with shame and embarrassment. So there are several examples that you can point to about, you know, what, what, what does it mean to be embarrassed about natural bodily functions? You know, think about, you know, how, how we feel about, you know, flatulence or the discomfort that a lot of people have around bowel movements and, you know, having bowel movements in their, you know, their office bathroom or a public bathroom, you know, uh, think about how uncomfortable we get, you know, if a man cannot you know, control his erection um, in, in certain spots, or even something like, you know, uh, our discomfort with the idea that, you know, childbirth, um, you know, can be, is, is, is messy and involves all types of bodily fluids. Um, all of that, that kind of sense of embarrassment, that sense of shame, that sense of awkwardness that we get around, um, get around those, those, those totally natural bodily functions reflects this idea, of course, that we should be able to control our bodily functions uh, at all times. And uh, we'll talk about how, you know, our relationship as individuals with healthcare um, is complicated by the fact that healthcare is somewhat predicated on you lose the right to privacy in a lot of healthcare settings um, because bodily exams are such a key part of diagnosing illness and providing care. And then also, oftentimes, if you are ill or even just being hospitalized, you do lose control over your bodily functions um, and the discomfort that that can cause. Before we, we talk about that in more detail, you know, you know, just note that your book does discuss that this concept of the civilized body was developed by Norbert Elias in 1939. And he provided this discussion about, you know, how do we arrive at this, this concept? And he talks about it uh, in regards uh, of like three uh, different elements. Um, socialization, you know, where we're taught to conceal uh, our natural functions of the body, um, you know, where things like, you know, defecating, things like, you know, flatulence, you know, even things like burping, you know, we develop these societal norms around when and where that type of behavior is, is uh, acceptable and appropriate. And in most places, it's, it's in private spheres, not public spheres. Uh, the other element is rationalization. It relates to emotional regulation. Um, so emotions are of the body too. Like we, you know, they they oftentimes have a an an outward external kind of stimuli that we're responding to. But then whether it's you know our cheeks, you know, growing getting red when we're embarrassed, or us becoming flushed when we get angry, or our eyes watering up when we're you know sad or upset or or once again angry. Um, but we're taught, of course, that we're supposed to regulate and control that as well. And we rationalize it, um, you know, that this is good, that this is a sign, of course, that we are civilized, that we are adult, um, you know, that we know how to do this. We rationalize it as it being a, a good and necessary thing in society. And then the final element is just individualization. And this relates to the fact that we're taught that our bodies are private and ours. Um, you know, so we teach little kids good touch, bad touch, and, you know, and that's important. Um, we come to think of there being kind of a kind of personal space bubble, and we expect people to not invade our personal space bubble. Um, and, of course, just once again, that expectation of privacy and that there are some uh, y there are, are some areas in which we expect total privacy, um, and, and usually when our body is exposed in some way, um, you know, we've been taught that, you know, th that this is a vulnerable a source of vulnerability um, and therefore is not, should not be kind of put out there for, you know, public viewing or what have you. Um, it's worth noting that a lot of these elements and really just the concept of the civilized body 
uh, itself, uh, it stems from the concern that, you know, we need to distinguish between human and bestial behavior. So when we say like humans, we're just animals, um, you know, we are, but we, we certainly like to make ourselves out to be very different from all those other animals, right? You know, that's, that's why, you know, we control our bodily functions and we control our emotions and, you know, we, you know, we expect and reinforce this privacy and we draw these uh, socially constructed uh, boundaries between private and public behavior. A lot of this, of course, is really just trying to delineate us as being different from other animals, of course, who, you know, who, who, who defecate and, you know, uh, have, uh, you know, sexual intercourse and give birth, you know, right there, you know, out in, in public spaces, right? The, the expectation is, is that animals do not need privacy and animals do not control their bodily functions. But humans, us, we need and expect uh, and should receive privacy. And we also are expected to control our bodily functions, particularly in public spaces. And so, of course, this does complicate things when we're talking about healthcare and our relationship with healthcare pr practitioners. Um, because as already noted, um, the practice of, 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 of healthcare um, usually involves someone having access to your body, um, your, in some cases, your nude body. Um, and then it also, especially if it's in regards to an illness, um, you know, when you're in these settings, you may not have full control over your body, your bodily responses and functions. And so because we've been raised and socialized around these ideas of privacy and control, that means that when we're in the when we're in these settings, and we are interacting with these practitioners, we can feel a source of like shame and embarrassment and awkwardness. And because the practitioners, of course, um, have been socialized with these same ideas, they can feel some some kind of awkwardness as well, uh, if if just from the fact that they can tell that we feel ashamed and embarrassed. Um, so your book talks about how there's strategies that both the patient as well as healthcare practitioners can employ um, to try to eliminate um, um, uh, the, these potential uh, kind of this this potential sense of shame and awkward awkwardness. Uh, you know, the the big emphasis, particularly on healthcare uh, practitioners is of course embracing this professional code of conduct uh, that they are in this setting that they're having this interaction as a professional and so you know as a professional that is like you know doing your breast exam you expect them to approach it in a different way and have a different set of feelings and engage in a different set of behaviors than like i don't know you know you you showing your breast to your date um as you're making out um you know you would not expect uh, your practitioner to respond in the same way, and it would be unprofessional um, for them to do so. And, and they note that, of course, a lot of healthcare uh, professional organizations, they have specific codes of conduct in place, uh, you know, in regards to how uh, the practitioners should interact, um, you know, what types of, you know, uh, procedures, uh, steps in the procedure that they should follow when they're doing these exams. Um, that kind of encroach upon bodily autonomy. Um, you know, they have these co codes of conduct in place to try to avoid patient abuse and patient, ex uh, and patient uh, exploitation. But then, of course, at the same time, there are also expectations for patients, right? Um, that, you know, that you comply with your practitioner, but that you also uh, interact with your practitioner in such a way um, that is expected of a patient. Right, that you aren't um, are you aren't pushing the boundaries in regards to privacy and control, uh, you know, either. Right. So if your if your doctor says, you know, uh, take off your clothes from the waist up, I I need to, uh, you know, check your breathing and your heart your heart heartbeat and you know put on this this paper vest, right. Uh, I'll leave you alone and I'll be back in a second. You know, what the doctor doesn't expect, what would be uh, inappropriate for you as a patient is to like to take off all your clothes um, and to just be there naked when the doctor comes in, right? Because at that point, that's now a violation of, of the expectations about what it means to be a patient in this situation as well. So really we have just these kind of socially constructed norms uh, in the healthcare setting, um, some of which of course then get codified into like formal actual kind of rules 
rules and, 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 and codes of conduct, particularly for the healthcare practitioners. Um, and, and we've done that as a society to allow us, um, you know, to still uphold or, or to kind of create um, some acceptable rationalizations and loopholes uh, for the lack of privacy and the lack of bodily control that can occur in these settings, um, given the fact that control and privacy are, and bodily control and, and privacy around your body are kind of such key values uh, in most Western societies. Uh, another example of how, you know, we've had to negotiate um, how to handle uh, when there is a, a kind of a collision between what society needs from its population um, versus uh, the population's kind of desire for uh, privacy and control over their own bodies. Uh, and, and your book talks about that in regards to the public health movement. Um, and so the public health movement kind of arose out of the awareness that the government needed some measure of controlling individual bodies, uh, particularly in order to eliminate the spread of disease and to eliminate public sanitation and contamination concerns, which oftentimes were re was related to the origination of, of some diseases. So they were like, okay, we told people that they have a right to their own body, um, you know, that this is, you know, privacy and autonomy issues. But when we give people the right to their own body, what happens when they engage in practices um, or do not engage in practices that result in a kind of larger safety concern? Um, how, do we, how do we then address that? And so, you know, the public health movement um, has from the beginning been kind of focused on, um, you know, concepts around like safety and, and cleanliness, um, you know, by focusing on, uh, you know, sanitation um, and, and what does it mean uh, to be clean, um, to practice good public hygiene, um, you know, this was seen as an encroachment on kind of people's individual rights. Like, it's like, do you have the right to be dirty and, and filthy and unsanitary? Um, you know, you do, um, except for the fact that you being dirty, unhealthy, and unsanitary can perhaps create a public health crisis. Um, and so the government, and then of course the government would need to address that. Um, and so you can kind of see how um, shifting definitions of, of, of what does it mean to be clean, your book talks about that. Um, that there's been shifting definitions around that. And as the definitions shift, the expectations um, of, of, of how you uphold this definition of cleanliness, of course, change along with that. Um, and it's like, okay, well, then what happens when people don't uphold those definitions? Well, some of it might just be like some, some, some social stigma and public shaming, right? If you're the person who, you know, doesn't wash enough, you smell and there are, there are kind of uh, ways that the public will sanction you for that. But particularly if it's, you know, during the time of a, a pandemic or if it's, if it's the type of behavior that really is related to concerns about, uh, the spread of disease, you know, you might have the government going as far as, uh, you know, not just giving recommendations for cleanliness, but, you know, legislating that um, and, 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 and making actual uh, legal sanctions for people who don't follow it. So, of course, this book was written pre-pandemic, but, you know, you can kind of think about this in regards to, um, you know, kind of the debate that, that, that some people have around masks. I'm going to pause for a second. So the debate that people have around masks, um, you know, this idea like, oh, you know, it's my right to not wear masks, you know, that really reflects that kind of common kind of theme, you know, that we all have been socialized with, that we have a right to our own body. Um, and of course, the fact that in a lot of states and a lot of cities, you know, um, if, if not at the federal level, you know, these governments have pushed back by making mask mandates, um, which is the idea that, you know, in interest of kind of larger public health, this supersedes your 
your individual right to to a bodily autonomy um you know and and people are are acting like that this is something that is brand new that it's never happened before but it's worth noting that you know you can look through history and see that there have been examples of governments um you know taking these types of of tactics uh before um almost all of which is is usually linked to like i said trying to stop the spread of of a disease or trying to address a a larger kind of sanitation issue um and your book notes that at some point it went beyond just the bodies to the homes not just having a clean body but having a clean home because of course that also kind of relates to that concerns around, you know, the spread of disease and, and contamination san sanitation issues. And it's that same type of thing. Um, the government will, you know, put out some recommendations. Um, and then, of course, if that does not work, they might take it up a step and then actual kind of put out legal uh, legal requirements and, 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 and resulting sanctions if you don't uphold those. Um, and it's just worth noting that although I keep emphasizing the social constructed nature of the definitions of the laws, of the practices, I keep emphasizing how they change over time and they fluctuate, that doesn't mean that this is all just made up, like that it doesn't have a real impact or effect that can be, that, that exists, you know, that isn't just socially constructed. Um, you know, we really do know that there have been major health crises that have stemmed from poor hygiene practices. And there have been major health crises that have been, uh, you know, stymied, diminished, um, because we have put public health practices um, in, in, into, into place. Um, so although, you know, what it means to be clean, what does it mean to be safe, what does it mean to have good personal hygiene, you know, although that definition has maybe changed over time as we become more knowledgeable, you know, around, you know, things like, you know, how do diseases spread and, um, you know, uh, and, and, and how do germs work, um, you know, as we become more knowledgeable about those types of, of, of uh, about that type of medical information, you know, our practices have changed and shifted, um, but it also is, is also rooted in the fact that this has been proven and shown to be effective uh, historically um, in, in, in several uh, uh, scenarios. So then your book kind of switches tack and, and moves from the civilized body to the sculptured body. And the thing, the, the idea behind the sculptured body is, is that there is this ideal in societies uh, about what does the ideal body look like? What does the perfect body look like? Um, and obviously this is socially constructed because it varies, you know, between societies. Um, so, you know, what the ideal body is in the United States is defined differently in uh, Sweden, defined differently in Korea, defined differently in uh, Chile, um, you know, so there's that aspect, but then there's also the, the fact that what the ideal body looked like uh, changes over time. So, you know, what the ideal body looks like in, in 2020 United States is different than 1920 United States, which is different than 1820 United States. Um, and I give you a link if you want to just get a sense of like how beauty standards have changed and shifted over time. But, but the point is, is every society has some sense of like, this is what, how we, what, how we, the society think about the perfect body, the, the body that we hold up for men and women as being ideal, as being perfect. And then we put that ideal out there, we disseminate it, uh, you know, obviously through all forms of media, um, but, you know, it, people also internalize it um, and they evaluate themselves as well as evaluate other people, family members, potential dates, strangers, you know, through this lens where they are comparing it to some sense to this ideal body. And so for a lot of people, and, and it does vary by the individual, how much this matters to you, um, you know, for a lot of people, getting that ideal body or as close to that ideal body as possible does become important. And so for this part of your book, the kind of primary question that they're asking is how and why people have tried to attain that good body. The how, um, you know, you're, they go over several methods, um, you know, things related to diet, 
Um, and of course, diets, different diets can fall in and out of trend. You know, the Atkins, the South Beach diet, uh, keto, uh, of course, is big now. Of course, uh, you know, one way you can manipulate your diet is by not eating for prolonged periods of time, what we call fasting. Um, intermittent fasting of, is, is, is one popular tactic, and there's several ways of doing that in society, all of which, of course, is meant to just control the amount of calories that you consume in hopes of, you know, uh, losing fat um, to get closer to that, to that uh, perfect body. Uh, it, you know, if, if the body uh, in your society that's being lifted up does not have uh, excess of body fat. Um, of course, you also can go about that with, with exercise and similar to diet, exercise goes through different trends. So, you know, most of you are too young to maybe remember uh, the, the, the Jane Fonda aerobics years. Um, but then I remember when I was growing up, you know, Ty Bo with Billy Blanks was everywhere. Um, and then, of course, at some point, you know, Zumba and hot yoga and the increased popularity of marathons, like all of those are trends. And now, of course, with the pandemic and people working at home, you know, you have the rise of the Peloton and other types of, of fitness that has this technological component to it. Um, so certainly people use exercise. Um, in particular, exercise is helpful if the ideal body uh, in your society has anything to do with with sculpting a, a, an amount of muscle because that is going to require weightlifting. That type of body cannot be accomplished by diet alone. Um, so, so people will, will will turn to to weightlifting um, uh, in 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 those societies uh, to achieve that type of body. And there's a gendered aspect to that as well. That type of heavily muscular body. Um, in the societies that have considered that ideal at different time points, that type of body has been more apt to be associated with men than with women. Now, of course, uh, you know, certainly in the last, uh, you know, 1980s and, and increasing in popularity, um, uh, dramatically since then, you know, you've seen surgical interventions. You can make breasts bigger or smaller. You can make buttocks bigger or smaller. In most cases, people usually just want to make their stomach smaller, not bigger. Um, you know, you, you can change the shape of your lips and your nose. You can eliminate wrinkles, all of that through surgical intervention. And now, of course, um, you know, there are even just kind of large scale surgical interventions like what occurs with gender confirmation surgeries where a person can change, um, you know, their body uh, in, in, in a multitude of ways. Um, in order to align with their gender identity, um, if that gender identity is is not, um, you know, does not uh, is, align with the sex that they were assigned at birth. Um, so, you know, this is particularly for our transgender individuals. Um, uh, you know, th that type of large scale surgery uh, is, is no longer uh, extremely rare and, and among that population is becoming uh, more common and more accessible. The why behind why people even uh, attempt to work on, you know, to work towards attaining this ideal is a little bit more complicated to answer. And we'll discuss it. And I'm going to introduce some additional concepts, um, you know, one of which being the concept of body image, um, which is basically just kind of how people feel about their body, um, how positive or negative uh, of a perception they have of their own body. And we know that one of the primary factors that can influence body image um, has to do with that, that sculptured body, that perfect body ideal in society. Because in a society where that perfect uh, body is dramatically different from the body that a lot of individuals have, um, and they see that body in in their media, in in movies, on in in magazines, in commercials, and television shows. Um, you know, in in social media, and you know, on social influencer accounts. 
you know, it can really uh, impact a person because if that ideal is very far removed from their own body and society is holding that ideal up as this is what beauty looks like, this is what sexy looks like, this is what attractive looks like, then, you know, it would be very hard to then protect yourself from having a negative self-evaluation of your own body if your own body looks very differently from that body. Um, and, you know, certainly if you like compare the average U.S. woman, and this is in 2010, so this is 10 years ago, and I will just say that, you know, while the average woman has not gotten, she's gotten a little shorter um, and has gotten uh, heavier um, in, in, in terms of, of, of weight uh, with, and, you know, obviously uh, body, uh, those, uh, those, um, my brain is just on the fritz right now, but uh, with those measurements, there we go. That's the word I'm looking for. Those body measurements, of course, have, have also kind of gone up. Um, so the 2020 woman is even further removed from the fashion model who is, you know, if you're, you're talking about straight modeling um, and not uh, what they call plus size modeling or what they now sometimes even refer to as curve modeling, um, you know, that those women are still much taller, much thinner um, than the average woman. And then even women that are, you know, in, in, in Playboy or those types of publications, um, you know, where they are curvier than the fashion model, they're like that hourglass shape, that's not the shape that most American women have either. So although there has been some pushback, and, and I, I show you an example of that, like the Dove Real Beauty campaign, which was kind of based as a real woman's kind of response to the Victoria's Secret Love My Body campaign, where, you know, the only thing that differentiates those women um, is, is maybe some slight variations in skin color um, versus the real beauty campaign, where, of course, you see women of all heights and, and sizes and, and body shapes. Um, you know, but those types of campaigns are still pretty, pretty uh, niche. Um, you know, they're part of our, our push towards body positivity, and they are more common now than what they were 10 years ago. But still, the predominant kind of images still align with that, that sculptured body ideal, um, which, uh, you know, women have. Uh, or, you know, not that women have, but, you know, that does exist for women. And the concern is, is that it does result in kind of having, uh, you know, lowered and diminished uh, body image and, and higher amounts of body dissatisfaction, which I thought I had a slide about that. I do. It's just all in the wrong order. This is what I get for playing around with my slide orders. Um, so I promise I'll go back in time and talk about men in a second. Um, but, you know, our concern is, is that, you know, this dissatisfaction that people can have with their body can go beyond just, you know, a few complaints like I wish my thighs were thinner. Um, you know, people who study eating disorders, um, uh, anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, or just kind of the broader category, um, disordered eating, where you may not have one of those established uh, eating disorders, but you definitely engage in eating patterns that are, that are indicative of having kind of a, a, a kind of disordered approach to eating. Um, we see that those, those numbers have increased, um, is particularly in regards uh, to children um, and, and, and college age students. You know, the, the percentage of women who have, have dieted in their lifetime is high. Um, and, and, and dieting isn't inherently problematic, but then if dieting can, can, can lead to starving, um, you know, the fact that the, one study found that 20% of female college students starve themselves to lose weight. Well, you know, obviously, um, that is a much more serious concern um, than, than just dieting. And so all of this kind of abnormal behavior um, 
we refer to as body dysmorphic disorder. You know, this idea that, you know, even people who don't have eating disorders, you know, that they might just have this, this, this uh, negative relationship with their body. You know, they, they don't view their body in an accurate and accepting light. They're overly harsh and negative. Um, they may engage in uh, disordered eating. They might engage in excessive exercise. Um, because the body also includes the face, you know, unhappiness about your face, um, you know, your skin. Um, one thing that's uh, become a rather new uh, topic of study is especially uh, people that buy and apply excessive amounts of makeup. Um, I read an article that for uh, young women between the ages of 18 to 25, uh, the average amount of time that they are spending doing their makeup um, uh, are, is increasingly higher than what women in that age group, uh, the amount of time that they spent uh, doing their makeup 15 years ago. Um, and of course, you know, it's kind of like, of course, you know, there are plenty of people that, that don't wear makeup at all. Um, and there are plenty of people that just, you know, wear, a, a, have a 15 minute routine. Um, I think uh, the concern here is that what used to be a full face of makeup when like I was in college, it maybe took about an hour at most. Um, now, you know, you have people spending two, three hours, you know, doing elaborate contouring and, uh, and these, these uh, you know, baking and, and, and these types of really advanced makeup techniques uh, that, you know, used to just exist on the sets of TV shows and movies. But now, of course, with social media, these tricks are being disseminated in the larger public. But beyond that, there's also just this, this increased expectation that you have this poreless, flawless skin, that you contour, you know, your nose so that it's the shape and that you, you know, you, you shape, you, you overline your lips so that you have fuller lips. Um, all of this, of course, just kind of is, is concerning in the sense that it reflects this um, excessive focus uh, on the body in achieving this, this type of body, this type of face. Um, so we're going to go back because I've, I've been focusing a lot on, on women. Um, does that mean that, that men don't have any body anxiety? And, and that's not true. Um, you know, oftentimes the gap between the ideal body for women and the ideal body for men, um, the gap is, 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 has, has traditionally been higher for, for women than it was for men. Um, probably, you know, and, and there, once again, there was this kind of interesting study I showed that, that, that I, that looked at the different depictions of superheroes and how the super ripped superheroes of today, um, comparative to like what Christopher Reeves' Superman looked like, like uh, just a slightly more fit than average guy, um, you know, that kind of is indicative of what I'm, I'm saying here is that for a very long period of time, the gap between the ideal male body and the average guy, it wasn't as dramatic of a gap. Um, we've seen that shift lately as there's been a focus on getting extra ripped and developing, um, you know, this really muscular, low fat physique, which means that for men, um, and there's a term for it, um, muscle dysmorphia, where it's not even just dissatisfaction with the body or sense that your body isn't, isn't, um, you know, uh, up to the standards of the ideal, it's explicitly focused on kind of your musculature, right? That that you need to be muscular and you're not muscular enough and therefore you need to pour a lot of energy and resources, you know, into developing these muscles. Um, and so certainly, you know, in, in, its, in a, a study that was, was done by an online company showed that, you know, a lot of men, if they said they could have their ideal body, they wanted what they call the freaky Frank body, which was like, you know, the body of like Arnold Schwarzenegger back in the day when he was a muscle, you know, a, a, a weightlifter. Um, but like, for a lot of, of women, you know, they wanted a, a guy that 
what they call beefcake Brad, a guy that, you know, looks like he can lift and, you know, you know, can, can pick up the heavy boxes, but, you know, isn't like this ultra lean, um, you know, muscular build. So, you know, there, 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 this alignment or, you know, there, this lack of alignment between, you know, what, what men say they want versus what women say that they're attractive. It's one of the things that people point to when they talk about muscle dysmorphia, right? That this isn't really based so much on, you know, for heterosexual men, you know, the messages that they're getting from their, from their potential partners on the dating market, this is really kind of being generated, you know, by the media kind of uh, putting these images out there that they then internalize. Now, it's worth noting that when we ask questions about body image to men, um, consistently across the board, um, you know, more men report, you um, not having the same extent of body image issues as women. Um, but, you know, like all self-reported research, you know, there is the caveat that men might just be less open about body insecurities than women. Um, that part of this might have to do with the gender norms for men and women, that women are taught that they should care about appearance, and that men are taught that they should not necessarily explicitly care about their appearance. Um, and and th that might be what we're tapping into. But it's worth noting that even though that gender gap between men and women remains with body image, if we look at men today versus men 20, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, um, we do see a dramatic increase in the number of men um, that it may to any body image issues than men in the past. Um, so certainly, um, you know, this has changed. This has consistently been an issue for women and it has gotten worse in a world of social media. Um, this hasn't traditionally been an issue for men, at least not in such a way that we were able to capture it in research, um, but it does seem to be a growing issue uh, for men now. All right. Oh, I'm still going backwards. Okay. Um, now, of course, um, for both men and women, part of the reason why there is this increased gap between, um, you know, the bodies that they have and the ideal bodies um, that uh, society disseminates, puts out there, uh, encourages them to internalize is the fact that what we have had uh, in, which has just increased in prevalence um, steadily since the 70s is obesity. Um, and so, you know, obesity, it, it, it is a medical term. It's, it's, it's based on a, a precise uh, calculation uh, for BMI. Um, and we basically say that, you know, someone is, is obese uh, if they have a BMI of 35 or greater. Um, and as you can see, and, and, and this is a, a already a, a, a dated chart from, from the CDC, um, but you can look at the prevalence rates of obesity in the United States, and you can see that although there are some trends in regards to race and gender and income, that just in general, you know, a lot in across a lot of groups, we have anywhere from one third uh, to almost a half of people um, being medically defined uh, as uh, obese, um, and certainly. Uh, that means that uh, I said I'm, I said 35, and, and really it's 30. Um, I'm being uh, trying to 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 do a video when I am sick is is proving to be difficult. Um, but uh, that definition of obesity, um, that BMI of 30. Uh, that that prevalence rate being pretty high, regardless of your race, regardless of whether you're a man or a woman, regardless, you know, of your income level, um, you know, we can see it if we just even look at like over a six year period. So this is from uh, the CDC, uh, and this is obesity prevalence rates. And if you you watch this slide and you see the changing amount in states, you know, you see states go from being light green, green to yellow to orange to the number of states that are in dark red. And that's indicating that among the adult population in that state, what percentage meet that definition of obesity? Um, and so by the time, you know, you see the states that are dark red, that means that over 35% of their adult population uh, are obese. So, 
and, and it's worth noting that in terms of ideal sculptured bodies, even as more people um, have a larger body, um, this has not been reflected in that ideal body that's put out there, which still in a lot of ways, you know, uh, you know, depending on who you ask, you know, for women, it maybe looks like um, some combination of a Victoria's Secret model, um, you know, and, 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 and one of the Kardashians, you know, um, depending on, on, preference in regards to curves and for men of course you know is that expectation you know of, of looking like uh whichever Hemsworth played Thor um and that's just not what a lot of of, of men or women in America look like um and so you know that also kind of explains why as that gap between the ideal body and the body that people have as that gap gets bigger, um, it's harder for people to even attain that body through diet or exercise or keep that body through diet or exercise, which is why, uh, you know, surgical interventions, plastic surgery, um, in, it continues to increase in popularity, um, you know, that America, you know, we do a lot of, of, of surgeries uh, on a yearly annual basis. The stigma around surgery seems to be fading. People used to be, you know, very hush hush about if they got any, any parts of their body worked upon. And now of course we have multiple TV shows, reality TV shows, um, dedicated to the topic. Um, and, and people don't necessarily hide the fact that they've had a little work done. Um, and so, you know, your that, that chart just kind of shows you that generally, you know, it, every year um, liposuction and breast augmentation um, tend to be, uh, you know, some of the most prevalent, uh, you know, surgeries um, that have been, uh, that, that, that people have sought out. Um, certainly in the last couple of years, um, surgeries related to, you know, shaping, reshaping, um, the buttocks have, have, have become increasingly popular. Uh, eyelid surgery, largely uh, popular with uh, uh, Asian, Asian American populations. Um, you know, of course, facelifts and, and neck lifts, uh, people seek that out to, you know, supposedly reverse the effects of aging. Um, <clears throat> but all of this just kind of just, just reinforces the, the, the idea that unlike the how, uh, of, of, of people getting the perfect body, the why people do this is, is harder and more complicated to answer. Um, your book talks about Susan Bordo's argument, um, that, this type of body goal uh, and the work that people put in to achieve this type of body goal is linked to a code of morality um, that we think highly of people who have good bodies and that we can be particularly harsh in our judgments um, and evaluations of those who don't or particularly maybe those who don't even appear to try. Um, and, and it isn't just that we, we evaluate those people and say, oh, you know, they, they don't have a good body or, oh, their body isn't attractive or, oh, you know, I'm not sexually attracted to a person with that type of body. The fact of the matter is, is of course, we take those judgments and we push them beyond the body, right? So we see their body and we evaluate it negatively. And then of course, we then perhaps make other assumptions about that person, um, their character, their work ethic, um, you know, based on their body, um, even though the, the, those additional judgments have nothing to do with the body itself, right? You know, we might say, oh, that person's, uh, because they're obese, uh, they're probably lazy, or they're irresponsible, or they lack self-control, or, you know, uh, they're sloppy, they do sloppy work, right? We, we, we take these already unfair evaluations that were body-focused, and then we expand them, uh, you know, to the entire individual. And that's why when sociologists study topics like obesity, you know, we're really interested in the social consequences of obesity. You know, the fact that weight discrimination um, has been shown to exist across multiple kind of milieus. Um, in, and I give you an example of a study that found that women in particular were less likely to be hired uh, if they were overweight. Um, and that in a society where, you know, depending on the state that you live in, you know, maybe almost 40% of the state could be uh, obese, over 50%, at least overweight, 
but yet there's still this fat stigmatization and that fat stigmatization is because of that ideal body, right? Not the body that most people have, but the fact that the body most people have is so far removed from that ideal that we stigmatize it, which, you know, is just crazy that we could stigmatize uh, a characteristic that so many people share. Um, and so another kind of uh, debate that comes up in so the sociology of health or another kind of not, uh, or another source of, 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 of research is, you know, to what extent is obesity a health risk versus it just being fat stigmatization? Um, there are people who study the treatment of people who are overweight and obese in healthcare settings, and they find that oftentimes they are denied additional tests um, when they have body complaints because, you know, their weight is, is seen as such an obvious risk factor that the healthcare practitioner just says, well, you should lose some weight, or that's probably related to your weight. Um, and they don't necessarily run other diagnostic tests. They don't necessarily consider other explanations um, that sometimes have been found to have been the cause of their complaint, not necessarily their weight itself. And all of this, of course, has kind of led to the rise of the body positivity movement, um, which is a, a topic that, that you're starting to see some social scientists research in, in detail. Because if you, you think about it in, in the forms of it being a social movement that is, is rising out of the stigmatization of fat um, and the kind of... Uh, um, the, the, the weight discrimination that, that people can face when the body type that they have is the average body type for society, but that average body type is not reflected in the ideal body type, you know, that part of the body, body positivity movement is, is preaching this idea that you should be you know, uh, accepting uh, of your body um, that, you know, that, that certainly, you know, eat well or exercise if it makes you feel good, but that you should not necessarily fall into this trap of, of excessively dieting or excessively exercising um, in order to, to try to attain this ideal. So all of this just kind of reflects kind of the social aspects of obesity, right? Um, so if you're looking for a topic or if you're looking to, to think about how do sociologists approach this, this topic, this is how we approach this topic. Not we leave the studying of, you know, does obesity increase your, your risk of, of, of heart disease? Or, you know, does obesity uh, make your, the, you know, diminish the likelihood that you're able to uh, 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 get pregnant? Those are the types of questions asked um, by people uh, in medical fields. But sociologists are interested in kind of those social consequences um, of, 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 of this medical uh, uh, topic. Which brings me to um, my final, uh, or your, the book's final kind of type of body, and it's what they call the failed body. Um, and they talk about this body being the failed body because it, it, it's the body that, you know, um, is not living up to this, this idea that the body should be this kind of, you know, smoothly functioning uh, uh, organism that that is largely healthy and doesn't have anything uh, wrong with it long term. Like it's one thing to get sick, but it's 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 the idea that you are more or less healthy most of the time. And so you know th this concept of the failed body therefore corresponds with you know ill health, particularly chronic illness and disability. So your book starts off by talking about chronic illness and the fact that there is an increased number of people living with chronic illness. And they identify two important consequences of this. Um, that one consequence is that the fact that so many people are, are claiming chronic illness, it really uh, hits out at the dominance of medical science, which is somewhat based on its kind of claim that they can cure everything or, you know, provide a cure. Um, you know, the fact that people who are chronically ill, um, you know, spend a lot of time, um, you know, in healthcare settings, getting diagnosed, getting treated, but yet they remain ill, you know, that challenges um, 
the medical model's presumption uh, that illness can be diagnosed and fixed, because what about if it can't be fixed? Um, and then the second kind of consequence is that if a person has a chronic illness, they're going to have to reconstruct aspects of their life and their identity, because for the most part, their social identities for particularly adults are kind of based around the idea that they are going to be uh, healthy, contributing members of society, uh, whether that's through work or taking care of the home, raising children, um, you know, there's this, this, this kind of uh, key element uh, in Western society that, you know, um, uh, that adults are productive. They're productive members of society. Um, and if you have a chronic illness, not to say that you can't be productive, but you might have to renegotiate, like, what does productivity look like if you are living with, you know, day-to-day -day pain? or symptoms that in some way disrupt your ability um, you know, to go about and, and, and live, your, live your life day to day without interruption. Um, so your book discusses the work of Barry, um, and this is from 1991, and his three concepts that help uh, us sociologically analyze chronic illness. Um, and the first of those concepts is biographical disruption. The idea that, you know, when you become aware that you have a chronic illness, when you start feeling the effects that you have a chronic illness, you're going to experience a biographical disruption. That whatever you maybe were planning for your life, whatever you were doing with your life is going to be disrupted. Because to be chronically ill, to be chronically experiencing symptoms, whether you know, their pain, whether the symptom is pain or it's disruption in some other way, it's going to make it hard for you to live out your life based on, you know, that kind of original uh, plan. Um, and although your book does note that this concept has has come under um, some some recent criticism, the idea that, you know, people with chronic illness don't have to necessarily have a biographical disruption, that the disruption can in fact just be temporary um, and not necessarily result in this, this, this huge shift uh, in terms of what winds up happening in their life. Um, you know, the overall kind of uh, concept uh, still remains relevant. Um, the idea that, you know, this chronic illness was not part of the original biographical plan. Now you have it. So what does that mean for your original plan? Um, and so then the next set of concepts um, which deal with adjusting to the impact of treatment regimens. Because the idea is if you're chronically ill, you're going to have to be receiving kind of ongoing treatment. Like that is going to have to be a key part of your life. Um, and so they talk about two different types of changes. They talk about affective changes and instrumental changes. Um, and so affective changes is basically how it, how it alters how you think about yourself um, in, in regards to, you know, your past before you had the chronic illness, as well as in relation uh, to other people. Um, and so, you know, it's, it, the kind of, you know, point here is, you know, how much about your illness do you share with people? You know, how does it maybe lead you to think about yourself differently, your capabilities, you know, what you wanna do with your life? Those are the affective changes. The instrumental changes is basically just, you know, what does it mean that you now have to comply and adhere to, um, you know, specific medications and appointments and, 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 and surgical interventions? Um, you know, all of that is going to require planning. It's going to cut into your time and your day, and you're going to have to plan your schedule around um, around uh, around that treatment regimen. Uh, you know, um, that's that's going to be a key part of your life moving forward, and and that is a, a big change. Uh, the third kind of um, uh, element um, that Barry identified relates to adaptation and management of illness. Um, so how do you adapt? How do you manage your illness? They talk about, he talks specifically about coping, um, you know, that, you know, 
this is the emotional dimension about how you try to hold on to certain aspects of your identity uh, in the face of the chronic illness. Um, they talk specifically about strategies, the particular actions or resources that someone utilizes to deal with the problems created by uh, the illness. So this is this this is kind of those those logistical kind of uh, strategies that you come up with, um, usually related particularly to the instrumental changes previously discussed. Um, and then there's style, which is how you present yourself in the social world um, in order to maintain some sense of self. Nobody wants to be defined solely as their illness. Um, so it's like, you know, how do you maintain, how do you um, uplift those other parts of your identity? How do you, uh, put yourself out there so that people can see and engage with those other parts of your identity um, in light of your chronic illness diagnosis. And before we leave chronic illness and talk about um, and talk about disability, um, you know, just know that, you know, one chronic illness or, or something that's sometimes called a chronic illness, but, you know, uh, a lot of people resist that label is chronic pain. And that's because pain is a symptom and not an illness. But the problem is, is for people who experience chronic pain, um, if the healthcare practitioners uh, cannot find a source of that pain, um, they don't really have a way of labeling what the person is experiencing. So this is where, once again, it's important to kind of, you know, realize that people can have an embodied experience um, that doesn't align with our socially constructed labels for that experience. So there are, you know, uh, uh, just a, 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 a huge number of people in society that, that are experiencing pain. Um, in, in, but the pain itself isn't the illness. But the illness has not been diagnosed. Um, and so this is an example of what's called a contested illness, right? When someone is saying, there's something wrong with me, I'm sick, I'm not well, um, but we either don't have a label for it or, you know, the how we label it is not necessarily uh, accepted uh, by larger society or the dominant medical community, we call that a contested illness. Obesity is a good example of a co contested illness, right? So some people see it as an illness, as as a, a medical uh, disorder. And, you know, some people are like, okay, that's just medicalization, you know, of a body type uh, or and or of people's choices, uh, life choices. Um, so that's another good example of a contested illness. Um, but especially for people that have chronic pain, um, you know, the treatment for chronic pain is a source of debate among healthcare pr practitioners, right? If people say that they're in pain, but you cannot find the illness and the pain is just the symptom, you have the ability to, to, to treat the symptom. You can give them painkillers. Um, but uh, especially, you know, in light of uh, the, the opioid epidemic, um, you know, there is a real stigma of being seen as a pill seeker, um, because we now know a lot of those painkillers, especially strong painkillers, are very, very addictive and people become addicted to them. Um, and, and this creates even, even more gray area around how to handle people that are complaining of chronic pain, um, because, you know, there are people that are experiencing chronic pain, and then there are people who are seeking out pills for their addiction and being unable to diagnose the illness that is, or, you know, or the disorder that is at the, the root of the chronic pain means that we can't really distinguish between the two populations. Um, and what you've seen, um, with a lot of healthcare practitioners um, is, 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 is basically limiting people's access to painkillers, um, which has been very hard on people who are experiencing chronic pain um, because now they, they, their, that pain is just not being alleviated. So then we have our final topic from the chapter, um, another way in which, um, you know, bodies can be classified as failed um, is the concept of disability. And disability is just a physical or mental condition that limits a person's everyday activities. Um, as your textbook notes, um, this is the first definition uh, which identifies disability as occurring in the body and as being a medical condition. Um, We'll talk about a, an alternative definition of disability in the upcoming slides. 
you know, I think your book makes a great point that, you know, our language around disability, um, you know, the fact that, you know, cripples, um, deforms, invalids, something's wrong, you know, it really reveals that we have some biases against this population um, and that we perceive them as being less capable, um, you know, that we consider them as being less able um, just because of, uh, you know, the physical or mental limitations um, that they may, ha they may have. Um, the, the chart gives you a sense of kind of the, uh, a, a rough sense of kind of what, uh, the different disability types are, um, as well as, uh, you know, the percentage of people in the United States living with those, uh, types of disabilities. Uh, so the second definition of disability is more social instead of biological in origin. And this approach defines disability as arising out of the barriers and attitudes located in society with which people with impairments are presented on a daily basis. So here is like you have a limitation, not because of how your body or your brain maybe is, is, is works differently, but because society is not set up in such a way that allows you to be able to fully participate in that society with that difference. And so kind of an underlying argument in, in this definition is if those attitudes were removed and the spaces were reconstructed, then disability is great reduced if not eliminated totally. And so with this definition, disability is more of a civil rights issue than a medical condition. Um, and so when you think of these two definitions, they kind of align with something we've talked about before, you know, the different models of health. So the different models of health, we also have different models of di disability, that medical model of disability where, you know, the problem is located in the body itself um, versus the social sociological model of disability um, where the problem is located in how society is structured and how society perceives those um, who are different, which is why sometimes you hear people refer to um, people who are disabled as the differently abled. Um, your book notes that the, uh, in terms of which model has been kind of gaining in popularity, um, you know, the, the, certainly the social model has been gaining in popularity um, and, and, and because it's focused more on the barriers that are created by environment, um, you know, it kind of opens up the possibility that there are things that we can do in society to allow uh, people who have a disability to live uh, more full and inclusive lives. Um, but that certainly doesn't mean that neither model is not without criticism because your book gives very valid criticisms of both models. Uh, the chapter ends with a very kind of brief kind of discussion of learning disabilities. Um, and really the big takeaway here is that when we look at the historical, when you read that historical sketch on learning disabilities and how those definitions have shifted and changed over time, um, once again, it just kind of points out that for a lot of disabilities, that social model, um, that, that, that social definition um, that kind of points to, you know, we define people as being not normal. We define people as, as having a limitation um, without necessarily acknowledging um, that in some cases, those, li uh, those limitations could be addressed by just changing how our society is structured and how it is operated um, versus what we have traditionally done, which has been to label people and, and medicalize the issue um, and, and kind of, you know, make them the problem versus looking at society as being the potential problem. So how do people who, who have been, you know, labeled as disabled, you know, what does that mean for their social relationships and status in society? Um, you know, there is a stigma um, around having a chronic illness as well as being disabled because, you know, the expectation, as I said, is that adults are going to be relatively healthy, contributing, productive members of society. We have what is called the sick role, um, which we discussed uh, way back when, when we were doing uh, test one material. Um, but, you know, it's the idea that you can be sick, 
but you know, the, the focus when you're sick is, you know, you withdraw from society, you get well, and then you re-enter society as a productive member. Um, and, and, and that focus once again on productivity um, and, and being in society in this way that is, is socially deemed as productive uh, can create, um, you know, a stigma for people who are perceived as not operating in society in that way. Now, of course, um, some people who have chronic illness and, 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 and who are disabled, you know, they deal with that stigma by trying to emphasize the ways in which that they are productive, um, you know, whether that means, you know, emphasizing that they work from home or the, the other contributions that they provide their household, um, if they are, are, are engaging in any type of caretaking um, or, you know, taking care of the home, um, volunteering, um, providing services in their community. Um, but it's oftentimes to address that stigma, they, they usually have to over assert the ways in which uh, they can be defined as productive, despite having a disability, despite having a chronic illness. Based off of that second definition, where we look to kind of the society as being behind um, the disability label more so than the body, you know, we have seen the treatment of, of disability as being a minority group um, in the sense that like other minority groups, they experience prejudice, they, they face negative stereotypes, um, they can be the victims of discrimination in, in, in public accommodations and in, 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 in educational settings, um, in work settings, um, and certainly, um, you know, this was especially the case uh, before we passed the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, the Americans with Disabilities Act was, you know, uh, originally uh, passed in uh, 1990, um, and it was meant to protect uh, people with disabilities um, against discrimination um, in a variety of settings, um, employment, transportation, um, public accommodations, um, education, uh, access to like really all state and local government programs and services. Um, so the problem, uh, you know, with the ADA uh, is, is the same problem that honestly minorities face um, in general when trying to prove prejudice or discrimination. Um, you know, it can be it can be tough to show that that is why you didn't get a job or, you know, that is why someone didn't rent to you. Um, you know, it's it, it, it did not make the discrimination go away. It maybe just made it less overt. Um, but certainly people who bring lawsuits on the basis of, of ADA, uh, you know, they, they, they oftentimes, um, you know, have to really prove that it was their, their status of, of a person with a disability um, that led to their treatment and not, not some other factor, which, you know, just obviously always can be difficult. Um, and then just in general, and this is really just relates once again to that whole kind of point that was made around biographical disruption and coping uh, and, and, and those types of, 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 of strategies and processes, is that a person that has a disability or chronic illness, it does impact their self-concept. Um, and they have to try to figure out, you know, what some people label as being this disconnect between their bodies, their failed bodies, their bodies that aren't living up to this like ideal of, you know, being largely pain free, limitation free. Um, and then their essential self, like who they really are. As I previously noted, you know, nobody wants to be uh, eliminated or, or, or reduced, diminished to just their, you know, their, their illness or their disability. And certainly people who have a chronic illness or disability, they run that risk. Um, so this is something that they, they, they really have to address um, as a real source of concern um, so that they aren't just kind of seen by people and perhaps even seen, you know, themselves, um, you know, as, as being just this illness or just this disability. All right, so that is it for this video. Um, you know, I, I, I am sick, uh, as I, I noted, um, as, as I'm videotaping this. So thank you for bearing with me, um, all the pauses so I could cough and 
and my brain just being fuzzy on, on some thoughts and some words. Um, but uh, the important part is, is hopefully, you know, you were able to get a little bit of explanation of these terms of this chapter, uh, because this chapter, um, you know, did have kind of a, a, a lot of ideas that I feel like um, are pretty unique to the study of, of, of sociology of the body and perhaps were ideas that you haven't really uh, uh, discussed uh, in other uh, sociology classes before.